The lighting circuits of today's vehicles can consist of over 50 bulbs of different sizes and shapes that serve to provide for exterior, interior, safety, and front and rear compartment lighting. The safety systems that we'll look at in this video include the horn and windshield wipers. And in this video, we'll look at how the various automotive lighting and safety systems are designed and how they work. And then we'll look at diagnosing and servicing lighting and safety systems. After viewing this video, you should be able to describe the operation of the various automotive lighting systems, describe the different types of headlamps and how they're controlled, diagnose improper turn signal and hazard lamp operation, describe the operation of the horn circuit, diagnose incorrect windshield wiper operation. Headlamp systems provide for nighttime vision and on some vehicles for daytime safety as they are used for running lights. There are three types of headlamps commonly used on today's passenger vehicles. They are sealed beams, halogen, and high intensity discharge lamps. Sealed beam headlamps, either round or rectangular, were for years the most common type of headlamp bulb. A sealed beam headlamp uses a tungsten wire filament inside a sealed bulb filled with an inert argon gas that replaces the oxygen in the air to prolong the life of the filament. Most sealed beams today are dual filament bulbs that provide for both the low and high beam operation. Older vehicles use two single filament bulbs on each side to do each function separately. A bulb lights when current is passed through the high resistance tungsten wire, causing it to heat up and glow. The electrical energy is transformed to heat and light energy. The direction of the light that is produced is controlled by the location of the filament in relation to the reflector that redirects the light forward and by the design of the lens that directs the light either straight ahead or at an angle downward. The halogen headlamp has become popular because the halogen bulbs can produce as much as 25 percent more light than a conventional sealed beam that uses argon. The halogen headlamp uses a halogen filled inner bulb positioned in a glass housing. The housing is hermetically sealed. The glass housing is the lens for the bulb and directs the light in the same manner as a conventional sealed beam. Composite headlamps use halogen bulbs but differ in that they have a separate bulb element inside a hermetically sealed glass housing that can be replaced. Composite headlamps allow the manufacturer to change the shape of the lens to fit design and aerodynamic needs. Composite headlamps are usually vented to dissipate the heat of the bulb. Condensation may naturally develop on the inside of these lenses, but that will not affect the operation of the lamp. When replacing halogen bulbs, remember to never touch the bulb as the oil from your skin will dramatically shorten the life of the bulb. The high intensity discharge or HID headlamps became available in the mid 1990s. The HID headlamps are often referred to as arc discharge or xenon lamps. While xenon refers to the gas in the arc tube, the lamps are actually metal halide lamps. The HID headlamps do not use a conventional tungsten filament. Instead they use an electrode inside a bulb filled with xenon gas. An electronic igniter is powered by a ballast that transforms the 12 volt direct current to over 20,000 volts alternating current. The electrode works much like a fluorescent lamp that causes the high voltage to arc across the electrode gap. That arc excites the photons or light energy particles and produces a bluish white light that is up to five times brighter than a conventional sealed beam. HID bulbs only have one electrode. Two bulbs must be used to provide for the high and low beam functions. The latest generation of HID bulbs are pre-focused and allow the use of clear housings instead of the lenses used on seal beams and halogen headlamps. These housings are made from a special quartz that filters out light rays of different lengths to result in a focused light pattern.
A typical headlamp circuit normally includes a headlamp switch, a dimmer switch, high and low beam headlamps, a high beam indicator, and the wiring and connectors. The headlamp switch can be positioned on either the power or the ground side of the circuit. The headlamp switch controls the operation of the circuit. The typical switch has three positions, off, parking lamps, and headlamps. In addition to the headlamps, the headlamp switch controls the parking lamps, tail lamps, side marker lamps, license plate lamp, and the instrument cluster lamps. In a typical circuit, power flows through the headlamp switch to a dimmer switch. The dimmer switch controls the operation of the low and high beam lamps. On many vehicles, the dimmer switch is a part of the headlamp or multifunction switch. Power flows through the dimmer switch to the headlamps. Depending on the type of headlamp bulb, that energy is either transformed to heat and light energy to produce light, or it is transformed to alternating current used to power the exciter of the xenon headlamps. The headlamp circuit is completed by a path to ground at each headlamp. The use of the headlamps to provide additional visibility of the vehicle during the day has become common on today's vehicles. Daytime running lamps differ from a traditional headlamp circuit in that they come on automatically whenever the engine is running, the parking brake is unapplied, and the doors are closed. Daytime running lamps also differ from the regular headlamp function in that the tail lamps are not illuminated during daytime driving so that following vehicles do not confuse the tail lamps for stop lamps. The daytime running lamps are controlled by an electronic control unit. The electronic control unit uses the switch position of the off headlamp switch as an input to determine that the daytime running lights should be switched on. When the headlamp switch is in the on position, the headlamp circuit works similar to that on a vehicle without the daytime running lamp feature. Automatic headlamp systems use a photoelectric sensor on the instrument panel cover to monitor the outside light level. The photoelectric sensor generates a low voltage signal when daylight is present. As light diminishes, the voltage signal weakens. A control unit monitors the signal and turns the headlamps on when the daylight is marginal. The automatic headlamp system is, as the daylight running lamp circuit, a separate system that can control the headlamps. Turning the headlamp switch to the on position overrides the automatic headlamp controller. The intensity of the instrument panel lamps that come on when the headlamps are turned on is controlled by an adjustable rheostat. A rheostat is a variable resistor that alters resistance by making the path that current flows through longer or shorter. A longer path increases resistance in the circuit and the bulbs glow less intensely. A shorter path lowers the resistance through the rheostat and allows the instrument bulbs to glow brighter. The operation of the parking lamps, tail lamps, and side marker lamps are tied to the operation of the headlamps. The headlamp switch or multifunction switch supplies power to these lamps any time the headlamp is turned to the on position. The bulbs in the parking lamps and tail lamps can be single or dual filament tungsten wire bulbs. Dual filament bulbs are used where the parking lamps or tail lamps are used for directional signals and hazard flashers. The bulbs can be either clear or amber colored depending on the color of the lamp lens. The color of the bulb does not affect its operation. Dimmer than normal headlamps most often result from an excessive voltage drop caused by excessive resistance from a bad connection. Other causes of dim headlamps could be a charging system problem that results in low alternator output, the wrong type of lamp that causes an excessive load on the headlamp system, or in the case of halogen bulbs, a bulb that has been contaminated by oil. The most useful tests to determine the cause of the problem are done with a digital multimeter. To check the battery and charging system, start with a test of battery voltage. Then start the engine and test the output of the alternator with the engine idling. 
Have an assistant turn on electrical loads, such as the headlamps and the rear window defogger, and watch the output of the alternator. If the alternator output remains near 14.5 volts, the charging system is OK, and you can move on to testing the headlamp circuit. Set the digital multimeter to the volt scale to do a voltage drop test. In a series circuit, the voltage drop across the connectors and switches should never be more than one-tenth of a volt. All of the voltage should drop across the load, in this case the headlamp. With the headlamps on and the engine running, check the voltage drop across the headlamp. It should equal battery voltage. If the reading on your meter is a negative value, you will have to reverse the probes in the connector. Any unwanted resistance in the circuit will cause an excessive voltage drop. The most common causes of excessive voltage drops in a headlamp circuit are loose connectors and poor grounds. Most often, connectors and grounds can be cleaned, but in some cases, the terminals that are badly corroded must be replaced. In the days of sealed beam technology, headlamp aiming was a common maintenance service. Today, headlamp alignment is usually only required if there has been a change in vehicle ride height or if the vehicle has been involved in a collision. On vehicles that use separate halogen bulbs, the headlamps are adjusted by changing the position of the bulb in the housing. Many manufacturers provide bubble levels integrated into the headlamp assembly to provide for headlamp adjustment. When replacing a halogen bulb, be careful not to touch the bulb with your fingers. Oil from your skin will contaminate the bulb and shorten its life. Xenon or metal halide HID lamps are typically not adjustable. A misaligned headlamp is an indication of other damage, such as a damaged housing or of collision damage. Turn signal and hazard flasher bulbs can be single or dual filament bulbs depending on the number of bulbs used in a tail lamp assembly. The turn signal switch is often a part of the multifunction switch that includes the controls for the windshield wipers, cruise control, and headlamps. A flasher controls the operation of the turn signals. Flashers are usually located on or near the fuse panel and can be either bimetallic strip or an electronic flasher. A bimetallic strip flasher uses a heating element wired in series with the turn signal switch to control current to the turn signal bulb. When current passes through the circuit, the bimetallic strip bends from heat, causing an open circuit that turns the lamp bulbs off. As the bimetallic strip cools, the contacts close and the circuit is again complete and the turn signal lamps light. The continual heating and cooling of the bimetallic strip causes the turn signals to flash. An electronic flasher uses solid-state circuits to control the timing of the current flow through the turn signal circuit. Hazard flashers work in much the same way, except that they use a separate switch that controls the current flow to both sets of directional lamps. Most parking lamps and turn signal sockets have a dielectric grease around the contacts to prevent moisture from corroding the contacts. Always make sure that the grease is used when replacing the bulbs. Flashers cannot be repaired and must be replaced if open or shorted. In addition to the headlamps and turn signals, the multifunction switch often controls the windshield wiper motor. There are several types of front and rear window wiper systems used by vehicle manufacturers. Most all systems consist of a wiper motor with a park switch, a speed control switch, an interval wiper switch, and a washer pump. The park switch determines the position of the wiper arms when the wiper is turned to the off position. On non-depressed systems, the park switch stops the wipers at the bottom of the glass. Where a depressed system retracts the wiper arms further to a position on the cowl below the glass. The wiper switch on the steering column directs the flow of current to the wiper motor. Most switches offer either a low or a high speed position in addition to the off position. When low speed is selected, the current is routed through a low speed brush in the motor, through the motor armature, 
and to a common brush that completes the circuit to ground. The speed of the wiper motor in the low speed circuit is reduced by the resistance in that circuit. In the high speed mode, 12 volts is allowed to flow to the motor armature through the high speed brush. The higher current flow causes the motor to turn faster than in the low speed position. Interval or intermittent wiper systems use an electronic timer, called a timer module, to control a relay that is in the circuit to the low speed brush of the motor. A variable resistor in the wiper switch controls the timing of the intermittent wipes. If a long time is desired between wipes, the switch is turned to increase the resistance in the timer circuit. This increased resistance alters the time it takes to saturate a capacitor. When saturated, the capacitor discharges, sending current to the electronic switch that powers the relay and completes the circuit. When the energy of the capacitor is consumed, the wiper returns to the park position controlled by the park switch. A typical washer pump works in conjunction with the wiper motor by automatically activating the wiper motor low speed setting. The washer switch is usually a spring-loaded, normally open switch that applies battery voltage to the washer motor when the switch is pushed in to close the circuit. The washer pump can be located in the washer fluid reservoir or it can be integrated into the wiper motor as a pulse type washer. The horn circuit on a vehicle equipped with a driver's side supplemental restraint airbag system includes the horn, a horn relay, a clock spring or spiral cable, and a horn switch. The horn switch is a normally open switch on the steering wheel that controls the ground side of the horn circuit. When the horn button is depressed, the switch closes the circuit from the fuse through the horn relay coil and the clock spring. The clock spring is used so that the circuit continuity is maintained regardless of steering wheel position. When current flows through the horn relay coil, a magnetic field is created around the coil. The magnetic force attracts the contacts of the relay and closes the circuit to the horn. When the relay contacts are closed, battery voltage flows through the horn to ground and the horn blows. When the horn button is released, Current no longer flows through the horn relay coil and the magnetic field dissipates. As the magnetic field is broken, the contacts in the relay separate and the circuit to the horn is opened. Complaints about horn operation can be either complaints of a horn that doesn't blow or a horn that sounds weak. To diagnose a horn that doesn't work, start by checking the fuse for the horn circuit. If the fuse is blown, replace it and check it by depressing the horn button. If the fuse blows again, then it is almost certain that there is a short to ground in the circuit that is causing excessive current flow. You can isolate the short by separating the circuit and testing for continuity to ground, or by using a short detector. If the fuse is okay, connect a test lamp between the horn connector and ground. Have an assistant depress the horn button as you listen for the horn relay to click. If the relay clicks and the test lamp lights, then the horn is open and must be replaced. If the relay clicks and the test lamp does not light, there is an open in the circuit between the relay and the horn connector. If the relay doesn't click, you've narrowed the problem down to the control side of the circuit. Use a digital multimeter to test for voltage at the relay. If voltage is present, the problem is on the ground side of the relay. The ground side includes the horn button, the clock spring, and the ground connection. Whenever you work around a steering column, it is imperative that you disconnect the battery negative cable and wait for the supplemental restraint airbag's capacitor to discharge before attempting any tests on the steering wheel column components. We cannot overemphasize the need for safety when working around airbags. Failure to observe the repair manual cautions and procedures can result in an unintended deployment and severe personal injury. Follow the instructions in the service manual to disable the airbag and to test the clock spring, connectors, and horn button for continuity. A horn that blows weakly is always an indication of excessive resistance, either in the horn ground or the horn or its connector. 
Excessive resistance can be checked with a voltage drop test. In this video, we've looked at the exterior lighting systems, including the headlamps and turn signal systems, and at the windshield wipers that are controlled through the common multifunction switch. Then we looked at the horn, another safety-related device that is controlled by the driver, and we looked at how to diagnose problems in these systems. Thanks for watching.